What's up gangsters? How about a 3D printing video on one of those sort of fundamental tasks that anybody who owns a resin SLA uh, or a masking SLA machine has to master and that is replacing the FEP, this film right here. Okay, now the first thing we gotta do is get the old FEP out, which is pretty straightforward. And uh, EPAX sends you a pretty high quality little two millimeter hex key for that purpose. How do I know it's pretty high quality? Well, because it took me a minute to chop it off using a little cutoff wheel in my Proxon rotary tool. Why did I chop it off? Because I am lazy and I love power tools. So, yep. And I didn't have a uh, socket driven one uh, in two millimeter handy. So since I do have plenty of uh, regular two millimeter hex keys around, I just chopped this one off. And now I'm gonna take all these out. Okay, that right there is how you handle 16 hex head screws. Uh, actually, socket head cap screws. Countersunk socket head cap screws. Nomenclature matters, right? Anyway, I almost forgot. Before I pop this out of here, let me show you exactly what the issue was. All right, now this, this FEP, honestly, not that old. Um, I really don't think it should have failed this soon. Uh, this probably has got, I don't know, maybe 10, 10, uh, 10 prints on it, maybe. I, I honestly can't remember, but here's what has happened, okay? You can see right there by my fingertip, there's a couple of specks of resin that are stuck to the thing. And I, I did everything that I could think of and that other people recommended to get, to get that all clean. Namely, I started out by running that little clean cycle where, you know, you print a little sheet of resin without the build plate in, and then you peel that out, and it's supposed to take all the trash out with it. And it generally works pretty good. But these little specks have not been coming up, and I chose to just, I thought I had got them all scraped off. Apparently not. Anyway, they just wouldn't come up using the standard method. So I asked on uh, the AnyCubic group on Facebook and I got a whole bunch, well, the first guy that responded was, you know, did you use the standard uh, clean cycle trick? And of course we discussed that. And then of the remaining 20 responses, half of them were idiots who can't take the time to read the fucking thread and understand what's already been discussed and just have to offer their so-called helpful advice so they can feel cool even though it's totally useless. But hey, that's a whole different rant about uh, internet etiquette. Anyway, there were some other good suggestions. One of them was use your thumbnail or your knuckle underneath the FEP to try and, you know, just create some upward pressure, make it a round surface that that chunk of resin will hopefully pop off of. Well, that did not work. I tried using my thumbnail. That obviously also did not work. And what it ended up doing was creating a dimple in the FEP, which actually is pretty easy to do. See, I can make another one right here. I mean, you can basically, you know, you can damage the FEP pretty easily. Uh, anyway, um, and as you can see, my repeated scraping also had punctured it. Um, so that this thing was done. So given that it was done, I started trying different things. Another guy suggested acetone. Now, acetone, chemically speaking, should have no effect on any type of cross-linking resin. Um, I mean, it's, you know, as we know, resin is not something that dissolves the way that, say, polystyrene does when you use Tamiya Extra Thin on it or you use MEK or, or you know, something like that. Um, so I didn't really suspect that acetone was going to work, and it in fact did not. But 
There were two guys in that thread who swore up and down that acetone worked for them all the time. So what I suspect is that this is a lot like some things where it depends on the specific resin you're talking about. This is any cubic craftsman gray and maybe other resins because of different modifiers they have and different properties uh, actually can be softened with acetone but not this stuff. Another idea that I actually thought was pretty good was to use duct tape. Um, I haven't tried that yet. Pretty sure that's not going to work because I seriously, I, I have done, I mean, I have, I have attacked this thing with a number of uh, scrapers, plastic scrapers, even a metal scraper after letting it soak in acetone for a few minutes and it's just not coming off of there. I mean, it's, you know, it is what it is. So that is why I am replacing the FEP. And as you can see, it's now out. And the next step is to go the other way and put the new one back in. All right, here we go. So uh, EPAC sends you with the machine a spare film. Nicely packaged in this piece of protective styrofoam. So what they want you to do, because I did watch their video uh, on the uh, EPAX 3D site. Great, and that's, there we go, got that out of there. All right, so what they want you to do is just basically place it on the uh, bottom of the, of the vat. Now hopefully I can do this. Um, it, this is the kind of thing that pre-spinal cord injury I would have done with my eyes shut because I had very nimble fingers and am highly mechanically inclined if I do say so myself. But I've really been dreading this because as you can see, my damn lobster hands, yeah, pretty clumsy. And I've missed a couple of little bits of resin. Obviously, we don't want that underneath the film. So, all right, I think we're, I think we're in business now. Anyway, I've been really dreading this because uh, I felt like that with my manual dexterity limits being what they are, that this was going to be kind of a uh, monkey fucking a greasy football sort of affair. And it may still be. I don't know. I'm, you know. <sighs> okay, maybe now I will not have any new pieces of trash showing up under there. Anyway, this may still be a complete fail. I feel, you know, I mean, that's the risk with anything that I try to do on camera. But uh, we'll see. Anyway, so what they want you to do is put the thing on there. And then uh, press the, press the uh, frame into place now. I don't know how that's going to go. That, that may not work out good. We'll see. Um, I may not be able to press that down in there like this. All right, so that didn't really work out good. So let's just try this sort of the brute force way. What they want you to do after you sort of press the frame down in there is poke some holes in the uh, corner screws. So we'll start with that and uh, I'll see if I can even get these screws to start with the frame sitting up there where it is. Okay, well that took some gyrations and some modifications. Uh, this little punch, not big enough to make a hole that you can easily push those screws through. Probably could have if my fingers were stronger, but that's okay because just making a little X with this uh, number 11 blade works fine. And this is one of those kind of things where if you can just get things started, then it gets a lot easier. 
Uh, but yeah, I tell you what, not not being able to easily twirl things between my thumb and index finger is honestly one of the digital skills, maybe the digital skill that uh, that I miss the most. But I think I'm in good shape now because I've got all of these uh, at least started where they've got a couple of threads engaged. And so it's a good idea, you know, before you switch to power tools to always do that. Um, that way you don't run the risk of stripping something out. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just go ahead and, and get good solid engagement with all four of these corner screws and then go back and punch the holes and do, do the rest of them. Okay, so that's got all the screws in and started. And now, of course, what I wanna do is to be able to just run them in there with the power tool. Now, some of you may be recoiling in horror right now because if I recall correctly, uh, one reason that I really was hesitant to ever buy a 3D printer in the first place was because everything I watched about replacing this film said that getting the correct tension on it was a matter of getting these screws all threaded in uh, at the right amount and you know all of them equal and then you got people who are you know tapping on this thing with a tuning fork and saying that you got to have you know a certain frequency for it to be the right amount of tension and I was like oh hell no now what I like about the EPAC system, and I quickly saw this from their, from their own tutorial video, is that they have taken the human element and all of that tuning shit out of the way that they designed this as they should. Basically what it means is, is that you just screw these things all the way down until they're tight, and this frame pinches the film and puts the correct amount of tension on it. You don't have any control over it. It is what it is. And that's exactly the way something like this should be should be done. This is good mechanical engineering. You just screw it in until the until you get a positive stop, and that's and that's the configuration that should be correct. So we'll see here in just a second when I get all these things tightened down. Okay, that's got all of those done. I mean, really, the worst part about that was getting the getting that ball end uh, hex key out of some of those, and I, you know, did not get you know through it com with the FEP completely unscathed. They can see I made a little bit of a scratch there or a d deformation or whatever during uh, you know one of those episodes of getting that hex key out, but. These are all plenty tight. There's, uh, I mean, these, this new generation of, of little bitty brushless 
Uh, cordless drills are phenomenal. I discovered these things when I was having renovations done on my house and my contractors were using these to drill into concrete and screw anchor bolts directly into concrete. I was like, I gotta have one of those. And they are great. They're light and they have an, um, an, a really impressive amount of torque. More than enough to get all of those things uh, tight enough for this. And, oops, probably better not do that. That's, <laughs> yeah, made a nice little flaw right there in the middle of the FEP doing that. But anyway, you know, I don't know if that's the correct amount of tension or not. I mean, I don't have a tuning fork. to test it and find out, but it sounds pretty good. So, hey, we'll see. Now the last part of the process is to just trim off the excess. Okay, so there you go, got it done. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm honestly, I mean, I'm kind of stoked that I managed to pull that off because like I said, I've been dreading it. I did not want to do this at all. In fact, I you know, talked to the folks at EPAX and I suggested, hey, why don't you guys do a VAT exchange program? Uh, because I'm sure that, you know, in addition to guys like me that just have poor physical dexterity, don't really want to spend the energy doing this themselves, that you know your average dentist, which is kind of what they aim their machines at, they, they probably don't want to mess with that either. Um, and a VAT exchange program would be great because you just uh, order up a new VAT. Uh, when you get it, you put yours in the same box, turn it right back around to them, and they credit you with like 80% of whatever the cost of the new VAT was. Um, you know, I mean, that's a service that, I mean, a, a brand new VAT is 79 bucks. I know that because I just ordered a new one um, because I figured out that even if I'm going to do this myself, that I don't want to be slowed down in my printing, so I want to have another VAT handy that I can just swap in there. So, uh, you know, look, I would gladly pay 20 or 30 bucks to have somebody else do what I just showed you guys on camera. That may not be the case for you, but there's, you know, there's circumstances where, um, yeah, I'm more than happy to throw money at it. They actually thought it was a pretty good idea. They didn't know if it was something that they would do, you know, but uh, they took it on board, and so we'll see. Anyway, new FEP, time to get back to printing. And uh, hopefully you found this useful, uh, regardless of what kind of 3D printer you own, but especially if you own one of these little Epax X1 4Ks. So, as always, I appreciate you watching, and much love.